Let us pray. Lord, you are more willing and able to help us than we are to believe and pray. Give us the good things that you know we need. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I was going to use this 42, but it's by Sabian Baron Gould, who I'm not going to use him. Uh, he was a, an absolute hater of the reformers. We turn to him by Thomas Ken, uh, hymn number 43. All praise to thee, my God, this night, for all the blessings of thy light. Keep me, O God, keep me, King of Kings, beneath thine almighty wings. Well, we turn to an article given at um, Miller Chapel, uh, 27 March, by Reverend Davis, um, held in the chapel at the seminary, Princeton Seminary, 27 March, 1900, in commemoration of the life and character of the Reverend Dr. William Henry Green, the late president of the seminary, the professor of Oriental literature. They included it in the Presbyterian and Reformed Review. So we'll start here. It's rather lengthy, so it's going to take more than one, one or two, three videos or so. William Henry Green was born within 13 miles of the college at Princeton almost within sight of the belfry of Nassau Hall that stands on the high ground across the plain to the north. The ancestry from which he sprang had been closely identified with the college from its inception. His grandfather's great-grandfather great was one of the leading founders of the Noble School and its first president. A nearer ancestor and also a great uncle had been members the Board of Trustees and their combined trusteeship had covered nearly one half of the period of the college's, college's existence. Two uncles, one on the mother's side, one on the father's, had recently graduated from the college. Another was soon to take his degree there in a later date, the young, younger brother would do so. One of his uncles was a merchant prince of New York City whose interest in education ultimately found expression in part in two munificent foundations, the John Green School of Science belonging to Princeton University and the Lawrenceville School. His father was not college bred. He was a manufacturer and a merchant and several of the remoter forebearers were farmers. This ancestry during its entire history in America gave many sons to the professions Trace back his genealogy by almost any line or branch. It reaches either to a judge or a clergyman. Three uncles sat upon the judicial bench, while a fourth practiced law. Another was a parson and another a physician. Nor must the services of his family to the Church of God be forgotten. Its history is part of the history of Presbyterianism in America. Beginning three years after the Presbyterians of the colonies had become organized in a presbytery, and for more than 60 years thereafter, his ancestry was represented in councils and activities of the church by two distinguished divines, father and son-in-law, followed scarcely by a break of two contemporaneous groups of elders, and each group a father was succeeded by a son. His two grandfathers, and sometime after his birth, his own father filled this office in the church. William Henry Green was born on the 27th day of January, 1825, born into a family which possessed traditions and ideals, born an heir to definite high opportunities in life, and born a child of the covenant. It required no extravagance of faith to believe that the infant boy was a child of grace and no intricate calculation of the probabilities to infer that he would have an honorable and useful career, that in the ordinary course of events he would be given thorough elementary schooling and be offered the privilege of a liberal education, that if he sought college halls he would find his way to Princeton, that eventually he would choose either a mercantile 
or professional life and that he would do service for the church of God. Anything less was not to be expected. This justifiable anticipation of realization in one point only, young Green was not sent to the College of Princeton. His maternal grandparents, Judge and Mrs. Kennedy, resided in Easton. And after he'd been to school for some time at Lawrenceville, when about 10 years old, he became a member of his grandfather's household in Easton in order to attend an excellent classical school which was conducted in the town. Two years later, he was matriculated as a freshman at Lafayette College. He was sunny-faced, bright-eyed, pure-minded boy in college, and led a blameless and winsome life. He was always in good humor, a quiet, diffident, and unassuming in manner, invariably prompt and faithful in the discharge of duty and able to sustain the course of study without finding it in the least burdensome. About the close of his collegiate course, he united with First Presbyterian Church of Easton on profession of faith in Christ. <clears throat> the demands of the college curriculum were not so exacting as today, and all over, all over the country, ingenuous youths who had enjoyed the advantages of good early education graduated at 18 or 17. Young Green belonged to the comparatively small number who took the first degree in arts before they were 16. He was thus ushered into professional studies and activities while yet a boy in years. But he wisely accepted the invitation of his alma mater to act as a tutor in mathematics. He served in that capacity for about two years, and after completing work in the first year in the seminary, he returned to Easton as adjunct professor of mathematics and remained a year. Thus it came to pass when he was in his 20th year and mature of mind before he finally settled down to the more serious and pro profound study of the theological curriculum. The close of his senior year in seminary, he was chosen by the faculty as one of the two residents on scholarships which had just been established and he was invited to insist in the work of instruction. He accepted the invitation. For one year after graduation, he abandoned himself to the teaching of Hebrew grammar. During the next two years, in addition to imparting Hebrew instruction to the seminary, he acted as supply, stated supply in the churches of Princeton. The following two years, he was the pastor of Central Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia. His people in Philadelphia found him a laborious, faithful, and sympathetic pastor. His sermons, he read, they were characterized by exhaustive study of the subject, flowing sentences, stately dignity, rapid utterance, intense sincerity of mood and manner. The pastor was terminated in 1851 through the election by the General Assembly in the session at St. Louis to the Chair of Biblical and Oriental Literature in the Theological Seminary at Princeton. On 28 of that year, he took up the work to which he had been called, not to lay it down until the 10th of February, 1900, when he was summoned to the eternal glory, a period of 49 years. He continued in this work during all these years from conviction of duty. Twice the effort was made to turn him aside to other service. The first time was about 1854, when he was asked to go out to India as a foreign missionary and engage in the work of biblical translation. After serious consideration, he decided to remain at his post in the seminary to which he had been called by the church. The same decision he arrived at 14 years later when he was elected to the pres presidency of the College of New Jersey. The event proved that in each case he did right, and that his course was approved of God. He did not translate the Bible into the languages of India, but he was privileged to have an influential part as chairman of the American company in revising the version of the Old Testament into the English language. 
and when the church was plunged into the debates which have been agitating it during the last quarter of a century, he was needed in the Old Testament department right here at home. He began his work as professor of biblical and oriental literature in 1851, as has been said. Okay. <clears throat> his colleagues in the faculty were Archibald Alexander, Charles Hodge, and Joseph Addison Alexander. But Dr. Archibald Alexander, the senior member of the faculty, died on October 22 of that year three weeks after Professor Green's inauguration. Prof. Green was now a man of 26 years. In outward appearance, he was tall, straight, strongly knit, energetic, with brown hair, firm mouth, piercing blue eyes that looked out from heavy brows, dignified in manner, reserved, modest, at times almost to diffidence, earnest, reverent and without self-seeking, thorough in his work and rigorous in the recitation room, meeting his classes with unfailing regularity, going straight from the lecture room to the study, evidently swayed by the sense of duty. These characteristics, apart from external change in the growing grayness of the hair, whitening of the beard, and stoop of the shoulders due to advancing age and years of study, marked him to the end. He had become a member for the remainder of his life of the teaching staff of a theological seminary. A theological seminary may be viewed under several aspects. People look at the material side. They speak of the buildings, their number, architecture, fitness for their purpose, grouping on the campus. They speak of the institution's financial strength or weakness of its bulk, the size of the faculty, the number of students. They ask what church owns it. This is the tourist's vision, the statistician's inquiry, and the sole concern of the census taker. Again, a theological seminary may be looked at from the spiritual side, and then the question may be asked, is it a living organism? Or two theories are found on it and put into practice. According to one view, the theological seminary is not a living organism. It has indeed a history in life. It shows growth and decay. It passes from one stage into another, and the causal thread can be traced through its development. But it lacks and should lack organic life. The professors are individual units, each living his own life, thinking his own thoughts, pursuing his own ideals, going his own way. They are not members one of another, animated by the same purpose, having the same aims, mutually dependent on one another as contributors to one another. If there is an organized curriculum, it is a concession to practical needs. On the other theory, the theological seminary may be a living organism with its principle of life. We are told how such organisms change their external form. The oak tree, we may pursue, perhaps assume, goes back to early geological ages. From the beginning, it has been an oak, that mysterious organic life which makes the tree generally an oak, and not some other tree, has persisted through the ages. The trunk, fiber, bark, leaves, flowers, and fruit have undergone change of form, size, color, and texture, it may be, but the oak persists through the centuries, reproducing itself in kind in successive generations. <clears throat> Looked at from the material side, thought of as a collection of buildings and an equipment of means for production, the theological seminary at Princeton may, in the inelegant parlance of modern business, be called a plant. Princeton Seminary, in a far higher sense, may be likened to a plant. It has been a living organism from the beginning of its history. It has had a distinctive life, <clears throat> which is recognized the world over. Its faculty and directors have changed with the passage of years, 
that the one characteristic spirit lives on. The members of its faculty have been organs of one body, each performing a functional part in the unity of the spirit and toward a common end. It was scarcely more of a functional unit during its first year when it consisted of but one professor teaching the entire curriculum dwelling under the same roof with the students. And it is now with a numerous faculty, a broad campus dotted with buildings and the students roaming in different dormitories. There was doubtless more uniformity of life, but not a truer essential unity. And when a graduate has returned after long absence in a foreign field or the remote districts of our own country, Though he has found the faces changed and the buildings altered and increased in number, he has recognized the same tree by whose fruit he was nourished and of whose life he imbibed. The seminary was planted by the church after much thought and prayer. It has been watched over by the church during the succeeding years. And as history is recalled and the work is recounted, which its alumni have accomplished throughout the world, we venture to say humbly and gratefully that it bears the mark of a plant, of the Lord's planting. Of this organism, Prof. Green at once became an integral part, consciously and heartily so. He was actuated by its spirit. He rejoiced in its type of life, and he performed his work as a function of the institution, harmoniously related to the labors of his colleagues. He was in full sympathy with the spirit of the institution in his attitude toward the Bible. To quote his own statements of the seminary's history, quote, but one sentiment on this subject has ever found utterance in its halls, close quote. Quote, Princeton Seminary has always stood for fidelity to the word of God, close quote. Prof. Green brought to the study biblical literature, a sincere faith in scriptures as the infallible word of God. As the devout astronomer enters his ob observatory and he points the telescopes toward the stars, not only observes their movements, but beholds the heavens, in the heavens, the glory of God and adores the creator. So Dr. Green entered his study as he investigated the origin and contents of the several books which comprise the scriptures, he beheld at the same time, quote, a glory guild, a sacred page, majestic as the sun, close quote, as he bowed in utter adoration before the divine author. Dr. Green came to the work of criticism convinced, to quote his own words, by the most abundant evidence that these scriptures are the infallible word of God, close quote. We are not left in the dark as to the nature of that, quote unquote, abundant evidence. It was common evidence which he convinced the church, the claim of the scriptures themselves to have divine authority, the heavenliness of the matter, the efficacy of their doctrine, their adaptation exactly to meet the needs of sinful men, the fulfillment of their prophecies, the constant appeal of prophets and apostles to historic objective revelations of Almighty God as the basis of their work, the attitude of Christ and the persuasion of the Holy Spirit produces in the heart that the scriptures are divinely true. These considerations and others of like character constituted the abundant evidence. Convinced that the scriptures are the infallible word of God, Dr. Green, to apply his own words to himself, did, quote, not shrink from the application of the most rigorous tests to the question of their origin or the nature of their contents, close quote. He had no fear for the result. He believed that the scriptures will triumph in the end and vindicate themselves in spite of all contradiction. Shortly after Professor Green had entered upon his work, the first low mutterings of a coming debate regarding the origin of the Old Testament were heard. The storm burst in its full fury toward the end of the 70s. The new theory let loose at that time 
could not maintain itself without first ridding itself of much of this abundant evidence. And when Dr. Green saw it was required to quote his own pregnant statement, quote, a new doctrine of the province of reason, a new doctrine of inspiration, a new doctrine of the evidential value of miracles, a new doctrine of the fulfillment of prophecy, a new doctrine of the infallibility of the Bible, close quote. He saw that the new theory bears on its face the marks of desperation. He suspected that its principles are wrong or its methods perverted. And he said in his own modest way, quote, there can be no impropriety in subjecting novelties to careful scrutiny before we adopt conclusions at war with our most cherished convictions and with what we hold to be well-established truths, close quote. The diamond of the first water, or rare beauty and priceless value, is an heirloom and a family. In fact, it has been committed to the family's trust and forms one of the bonds of family union. Its history is traced by written documents to the mine where it was obtained. Its genuineness has been pronounced upon by experts in whom the utmost confidence may be reposed. It possesses the property of a diamond. It has both the form and the transparent beauty without which it would not be a diamond. It refracts the light, disperses its rays of beautiful color, its point is hard and sharp enough to etch glass, and it proved hard enough to grind other diamonds to dust when its own facets were being cut. This particular diamond has long been an object of admiration. Processes by which under God it was produced have been the profound study of scholars, and they have made it the subject of searching inquiry. At length, certain other scholars propose to prove that it is not a genuine diamond that it was not made by God in the crucible of nature, but is the work of man, who at most used material which God had made common on earth. To do so, they undertake to separate the stone along the lines which are not those of the diamond, and not those of the natural cleavage of this particular gem. They cannot make it split cleanly along the lines which they propose and they are obliged to explain away its properties, to call in question the documents which attest it, and to refuse to consider the word of preeminent experts of the past. There can be piety for one who believes in the genuineness of the stone and knows the proof of it in subjecting such novelties to careful scrutiny. The believer of the diamond would not part with it or share in it at any price. Yet if artificial, he would cast it away at once. <clears throat> For such a one, there can be no impropriety in subjecting novelties to careful scrutiny before he adopts conclusions at war with his most cherished convictions and with what he holds to be well-established truth. Professor Green represented the spirit of the seminary in another respect in scholarship. Dr. Joseph Addison Alexander created the Department of Oriental and Biblical Literature in the seminary. The subjects embraced in it had, of course, been taught, and they had been taught efficiently. Literature had been produced. The work had been organized into a separate department of instruction, and the department had been energized by a professor who'd long exerted beneficent influence upon it from another chair. It was Dr. Joseph Addison Alexander who gave the department an international reputation. To remarkable linguistic gifts, he united the mind and methods of a scholar. He had breadth of view, catholicity of sympathy, power of discrimination, soundness of judgment, love of truth for the truth's sake. These superb qualifications he employed by compelling an entire body of opinion on the question at issue to pass and review before him and subjecting each separate conclusion reached by others to crucial examination. 
These characteristics of the man and his method constitute the charm and value of his work and render it now, even after the lapse of half a century, not obsolete to the diligent searcher after truth. <clears throat> his successor in the Old Testament department was William Henry Green. Professor Green was not a linguistic, linguistic genius like his brilliant predecessor. He did not speak seven language, languages and read 30, but he understood the needs of students who are not born linguists. And according to tradition, he soon proved himself to be superior to his predecessor as an instructor. And though he did not revel for pastime among the languages of men, he was a scholar with ample philological equipment for his specialty. He taught at one time or another Hebrew, Aramaic, and Arabic, and had a reading acquaintance with Ethiopic. Assyrian was added to the Semitic group a few years before he laid aside his grammatical work, but it was not placed on a firm scientific hold until several years after he had surrendered himself to criticism. So that while he did not wholly neglect his newly unearthed language, he felt that it had no direct bearing in which he henceforth was to be engaged, and he did not pursue its study. His Hebrew grammar was published in 1861. It's eclectic in method. The grand grammatical systems in vogue at the time were those of Gesenius and Ewald, or Ewald, or Ewald. It was acknowledged that he had created a new era in Hebrew learning. Nevertheless, Dr. Alexander pointed out in the Princeton Review for 1837, with his acknowledged greatness, he is often absurd and in general obscure. Cassinius died in 1842, but editions of his grammar continue to appear in rapid succession under the editorship of Rodiger. Rodiger introduced changes into the work of his master still stunk, stuck to the nomenclature and treatment borrowed from the Greek and Latin grammars inherited by Gesenius. In 1838, Nordheimer published a grammar which marked an advance in method. Following Ewald, he cast off the classical terminology and treatment, which are false and misleading in Hebrew grammar, while at the same time he avoided the excessive refinement of Ewald. Nordheimer's work was, however, marred by the occasional inadequacy of statement and encumbered by philological discussions which were premature, considering the backward state, or rather the lack of comparative Semitic grammar. Well, I think we're going to have to call it here. I hate to interrupt in the middle of a good biography on Prof. Green, but we must press forward. Verse 2 of him 44 save us from troubled restless sleep from all ill dreams your children keep so calm our minds that fears may cease and rested bodies rest in peace let us pray worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches <clears throat> and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing amen god speak